thank you for attending. And yeah, do we have a moderator, or are we just going yeah. Q and A at this point? Yeah, we'll do Q and A. Okay. Uh, so one thing we did in the last time that I think was really good was everyone just gave one other principle that they thought was really good for uh, portfolios, for getting a job, and the like. So if uh, <coughs> folks want to, someone want to jump in, maybe we go the reverse way back or something. Sure. Okay. Dang it! <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of my principle. Um, I think uh, what what number four? What, yeah, <laughs> principle number four. Remember, write that down. Uh, I think um, uh, the so the biggest point of failure I had when I entered the industry was I was very concerned with I I do not need to talk to people I need to be really really good at what I do and and that was just just incredibly woefully wrong now you do need to be really good at what you do but um, but it, if you're not like you can just sink yourself by by not being a good communicator and a lot of that stuff can seem harmless at the time like one of my biggest uh, initial failures was I, I went straight from Ohio to Pixar, which was so jarring. I'd never interacted with a professional in my life. And suddenly I was around like all the gods, right? And that was the wrong thing, right? Thinking of them as gods impeded my growth a lot of ways because um, when you idolize someone, you you never offer them help, right? Because what, what does God need from me? Nothing, right? But they take that, I mean, for them, they're just in their own eyes, they're just people, and it's weird that this person never cares about them, right? All I would ever ask about is for me. Um, you also just think they're invincible. Uh, it, it's really easy to just throw someone under the bus. Oh, God. I uh, once got, like, feedback from a random passing animator at Pixar, and I immediately implemented it, and thereby destroyed half my scene and redid a bunch of stuff, because I just didn't even think. And then my supervisor was like, what is this change? This is like, we didn't talk about this. And I just immediately go, that guy told me to do it. <laughs> Which is just like a horrible thing to do to someone. But I wasn't even thinking that way. Because I was just thinking, like, in my head, it was like, well, God told me to do it, right? <laughs> it's like, I had to uh, um, Don't you guys all have the same exact thoughts? Because um, you're all I, my idols, right? So, so just be wary of that. It's like, there are harmful things that come about from, from even just idolizing someone. It is a way of dehumanizing someone. Uh, so, so that was that was my thing. Just uh, be ready to form relationships, you know, and, and and real ones, not one where you're just asking for favors. Like, like asking a leader, like, how was your day, or what are your fears, or what are your career goals? You'd be surprised the outpour that they will give you because no one ever asks them that, right? Um, I barely do it enough, and, and the first time I did it, I was like, oh my god, this is a person. <laughs> like, they might be the art director, but they have a lot of goals and fears and and I'm like, holy crap. And, and I like, ask them, and they're like, you have no idea how infrequently someone will just say that to me. I never get to sit talk about this. I'm like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. Anyway, sorry, that's my, that's my spiel. <laughs> um, I'd say for me, the biggest thing would be um, don't try and generalize. Uh, that's what I tried to do when all throughout college. Um, I wanted to be good at everything, so uh, so people would want to hire me because I know so much. And it's like that is really not the way to go. Um, you you want to you want to try and specialize in something. It's good to know a lot of things, but uh, who do you think they're going to hire if uh, you know you're among a group of people and it's like, oh, this guy knows a little of all of this, but this is the guy that we need to hire and get the job done and he does it way better than all of these other people. Um, once you get in, then you can start to try and branch out, but initially you wanna, you wanna find something that makes you happy and go for it and just do really well at that. Um, I, I was definitely uh, trying to generalize way too much. I was like, I wanna do particles, I wanna do local design, I wanna do art, and I tried to just get good at all of this stuff and you can't, do it with the amount of time that it takes to get really good at all of those things. Um, so I just focused on level design and environment art because those are pretty much hand in hand kind of. Um, and I ended up getting hired for level design. Then I sort of shimmy my way into art once you know I was able to establish myself as a professional in in my trade. So. Um, yeah, I'd say definitely just figure out what what your main 
skill you want to be. It's like it's like an MMO, right? Like you take your characters, like all right, you have your professions, and you have to figure out which which one you want to level up first, right? Um, and do that, and you can have your secondary and all that other stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, just keep at what you want to get good at, and, and other things will follow. That's awesome, man. <clears throat> um, yeah, for me, like, the, the thing that I always uh, try to hit home for stuff like this is, you know, having this, kind of like having the right attitude and also having this kind of perseverance, you know, this mixture of willingness to uh, learn and open-mindedness, but kind of like this, you know, you know, whatever the opposite of a mentality of sort of poverty is, you know, if you want to be a game designer, it's like, you, you are a game designer already. I mean, people kind of conceptualize, you know, oh, I've made it, or I'm a, I am a whatever I am if I'm making money doing it, but uh, there's all this other stuff that you can be doing before you're actually making money doing something like being a game designer. I mean, coming to something like this, where it's like, okay, well, how can I figure out how to get there? I mean, that's, that's already the, the right step. And I mean, I, I really believe that if in your head you want to be something, you can kind of manifest your destiny by just keeping at it. It's like, talk to people who have something to teach you, you know, figure out, look, look for job openings everywhere, figure out what else you can do um, to kind of support you. It's like, uh, well, maybe I can write some articles or I can review some games or um, maybe I have an idea for a game and I'm gonna make it on my own on the weekends. My friend's a programmer and he can program my game and we're just gonna make stuff happen. Just what, whatever you can do without, you know, you don't have, it doesn't have to start the first time you get a job. So what can you do in the meantime to be getting better um, at your craft? And then if you just keep doing that and don't focus so much on, I've got to get this job, i got to work at this company, but just focus on being better at your craft and then the doors will open if you persevere. If you just keep, keep at it and don't give up, eventually the doors will just open for you. I mean, I really firmly believe that. So that would be my principle, I guess. This question is like super heavy. I love this. This is way early in the panel and we're already waxing romantic about all this shit. Um, I think that success in general, and just as specific to this, is this fascinating combination between humility and confidence. Yeah. And that's, I think, the greatest lesson I've learned is because no matter how good you think you are at something, you're, you're not the best. And even if you are the best, in five seconds you won't be anymore because somebody else is moving forward. And so you have to, on one hand, always be like, what new things can I learn today? How can I get better at what it is I want to be good at today? But at the same time, when it comes time to do something, you just have to do it with confidence, even if you're not confident. It, it doesn't matter. Like, you might not be sure you can do it, but if it's your job to do it, or if this is what you want, you just do it anyway. And you'll kind of learn it, like, over time, and you'll screw up, and you'll make some mistakes, but it's just not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. I have almost the exact opposite advice. Okay. <laughs> Be insecure. Be insecure. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, there's actually a period of time that uh, all new game designers go through, and this is something at Blizzard very specifically, where they come in full of piss and vinegar, they've been on the message boards, they know everything there is about the game because they're a hardcore player of the game. What they don't understand is that behind every decision and behind every de uh, design in the game is an actual chain of thoughts that went into making any one individual piece of the game manifest. And so they go through this process of having to learn uh, what it is that they don't know. And so the, the, the one big thing I think you need to take into any uh, sort of creative space or any kind of creative job, especially the games industry, is try to be smart enough to know what you don't know and stopping yourself from having to jump into every single conversation about every single feature in the game and learning from the people that have been doing it for quite a while is the best way to, one, start to actually broaden your chops in terms of what goes into making the right decision for a game, but also start to uh, build some trust with the people you work with. You know, I've seen, and again, uh, you know, I hire game designers and I work with game designers constantly, and. I can tell you that the number one thing I see typically sort of sabotage someone's opportunity to be part of a group and to be part of a, a very well-oiled you know, well and working game design uh, team is that they don't build trust. 
And without that trust, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to take your collaboration with the right spirit. And I've seen it over and over again. So the big piece of advice I would say is uh, when you first met, and, and my assumption is that most of the people here don't have game jobs now and would like to have them in the future. So you're going to have to start off at a place where you're an unknown entity, that you're an unproven quantity. And so you need to take the time to slow down, listen, don't jump into every conversation. And then eventually, once you've built trust up with the group, uh, start to plug, plug in some great comments. And uh, that will work for you. And it's one of the most common mistakes I see over and over again with people getting into the creative industries. And not just games, actually. It's, it's universal with you know sort of teen creative exercises. All right, everyone else has gotten all deep and philosophical <laughs> and macro on us. And I agree with all of them, especially the ones that contradict each other. So I'm going to go ahead and get a little more micro on this and talk specifically about your portfolios. It's really difficult to have a critical eye for one's own portfolio. A, get other folks to look at it and really rip it apart. B, the easiest rule of thumb for judging your own portfolio is if you're going to be using this to apply for professional positions, then the stuff in your portfolio should all be of professional quality. If it wouldn't fit in a game for the company that you want to apply for, then it should not be in your portfolio. I can't think of how many times I've seen people stop looking at a portfolio when they get just a one, not even bad piece, but one mediocre piece. Now, anyone who's hiring in the game industry sees way too many portfolios and resume. Any excuse to stop looking at it, it will be taken and used so they can go on to the next one. So make sure everything in there is of uh, professional quality. Ke Kevin made a great point about being really good at something. The flip side of that is you want to at least understand what everybody else does. So do try, if you're going to be an artist, do take some time to try some level design. Everyone really can code, believe it or not. Uh, give coding a try in one way or another. If you're a coder, really try to mess around in the art program so you can see just what a pain it is. Uh, everyone, has, uh, everyone can do uh, some design work, everyone can try some audio. Well worth understanding what everybody else's roles are. The portfolio comment is spot on. It's, it's better to have one thing in your portfolio that's perfect than you know one thing that's perfect and five things that are just okay. Go with the one thing every time. Yeah, we'd get artists for EverQuest that would give us like stuff that was a bunch of spaceships and things like that, and we'd be like, well, this is fucking cool, I guess, but EverQuest. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good idea to have multiple portfolios, seriously. If you're applying to a company, have stuff that fits the kind of style they do. If they're cartoony, have cartoony. If they do realistic, have realistic. And make sure it really is all good. All right, let's uh, go ahead and uh, do some Q&A. So, I'll pick our first victim. Stand up. Thanks. How's it going? Hi. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah, I've got a question for you guys. What are you all doing here at 4 o'clock, 4.30 on Monday? I actually think I might have that game end. job yet. <laughs> we don't want it to end. There you go. I uh, actually think I might be in the wrong panel. Uh, I'm a musician, and uh, I've had a couple songs licensed for really low-budget games, like Flash games, like they give away for free on Facebook. Uh, but I... Um, I'm curious what if you could give me a perspective, insider's perspective, of what the relationship is with the songs or the artists behind the songs and the actual game developers, designers at various levels of the industry. Because obviously, I want to try to monetize my, you know, the licensing. Uh, my, I mean, actually, I have a friend who does uh, games and he's worked on some titles. But the problem that I've had is that the sort of starting out guys can't really afford to license the music. Um, and the guys at the higher up levels with the larger titles, they, they sort of already have theme songs from their shows or their movies or whatever that they need to work with. So could you guys kind of give me any advice on how to break into that side of the industry? All right, I will jump all over that one. Uh, first of all, the one thing I haven't plugged yet is October 4th to 6th here in Atlanta. We have the largest professional game development conference in the South. It is the Southern Interactive Entertainment and Game Expo, Siege. 
the website is siegecon.net. That's I before E S I E G E C O N dot net. We have a great audio track run by Chris Rickwood, who's an awesome audio professional in the industry. We bring in people like Jesse James Allen from EA, who's worked on Mass Effect and Madden, uh, lead audio over there, and folks from UB and so forth. Uh, come out to that track, number one. Number two, there are great sites now for licensing your music to anyone, and if you're not already up on those sites, get there. You can, I'm, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but uh, get up on those. And some are run out of Atlanta, actually, some of the better ones. Uh, and you'll be licensing your music to games and commercials and everybody else under the sun. Uh, the next uh, general point is that it isn't, for audio, we do want folks who have already done a game before we start paying them to do audio for games. So it really does help to work with the team that's putting something together, even if it was, is free, just to get that portfolio uh, piece going. Uh, there are secrets that you'll learn, like you don't want anything in your music that sounds like sound effects. As soon as someone playing a game hears something, they should mean something, it better mean something or they're going to get pissed. So it, and you start to learn how the pacing for game uh, music works. And, uh, and so on. And finally, there are a lot of small and mid-level teams who can pay something, if not a huge amount, for titles. Chris Rickwood makes a really good living as an audio engineer, not in-house at anybody, and licensing and stuff for others. There are a number of audio, other audio professionals in this town who do that. Uh, so it, it's definitely doable. But the one thing that audio people have to do is network like mad. That's one tip we all didn't push here earlier, that most jobs are found through networking by knowing somebody who knows somebody. And audio guys gotta do that twice as hard because you're not the coders, you're not the artists. You gotta know people inside. And once you know the audio engineers are the guys who assign the work on it. I, I can do a little quick. Uh, so League of Legends has a really, crazy awesome audio team for a lot of things and, and one of them is we have a composer that we literally make a new theme song for every single champion that we release which is like you know every every month or so every character that we add to the game gets their own composed music and sometimes they're straight up like songs uh, that are sung and composed and all that stuff and and most recently we even had crystal method do um do do one of them um, so I, I don't know too much about licensing stuff, but the, the background of the people that I work with are, are kind of wide ranging. But they're you know the uh, Christian Link, who's who's a composer that, that does a lot of that stuff. He he was like in a like a rock band in Germany, and uh, and it just seems like a lot of what he did was demonstrated. He had to demonstrate the value of what he was doing. Right? Um, we didn't used to do that, and then Christian Link's like, I think if we did this, it would have a ton of value, and I'll demonstrate that. And then as soon as it was demonstrated, it was like, right, it was like, oh, here, do this full time, you know? Um, and there's a lot of positions that have been sort of generated that way in, in a lot of studios and at, and at Riot. Um, and, and it's awesome. So just find, like, find the ways that excite you, I guess, about, about how to, you would contribute value. And this goes for anybody in any discipline. Like, have those unique ways you contribute value to a video game and, uh, and, and just do it and, and do awesome stuff and stuff that makes you happy. And hopefully that leads you places other people will be like, wow, that's awesome, we, we should do that, you know. Um, hopefully that helps, I, I don't know too much about audio itself. Hi, um, oh, whoa, way too close, sorry about that. Um, I apologize, this is gonna be somewhat of a similar question. Um, I'm actually an active working composer right now in a different medium, uh, trying to move over. I've gotten my first job as an independent, uh, with an independent uh, group. Um, but my question really is kind of the mediums that I've worked in and the way that's kind of worked um, as far as getting jobs and stuff like that, it always seems to me like in games like the audio production start very, very post-production and seems to be kind of separated from a lot of the other stuff that's going on. So as far as getting jobs in that kind of area, I mean, are things like uh, demo reels and stuff the kind of stuff you guys would look at? Or is it more of a like, hey, I know a guy that knows this other guy. And in this world of people, Nowadays, anyone with a Casio keyboard and a 30-day trial subscription to Pro Tools is a composer. Uh, how does one um, kind of stand out, basically, when, when trying to do those types of things? I mean, uh, again, like, I, I would say uh, um, it's, it's all the things you said, right? Like, it, it helps a lot if you know people that, that trust you already and want to work with you no matter what you do. And, um, in, in terms of standing out from, from the crowd, it's, it's all about like really embracing the, your geek, 
right? What, what do you love and demonstrate that? Like, uh, and, and again, that, uh, this is more broad advice, but, but in the sense of like, if you went in and you're like, um, I love this game and I think it would be so dope if it had this UI music that layered in on whenever you chose stuff or something like that, and I'm just gonna mock that up. And, and, uh, and you know, people will be like, holy crap, that's awesome, you know, like, uh, and, and you'll stand out from people that are just making, oh, I just made a generic track, or, or, or I just made what I hope will get me a job, the bare minimum, um, versus like when you're just like, I'm clearly in love with this, right? Because that's what we wanna see, we wanna, see people, we wanna work with people that are just like, I freaking love this, um, and I, oh, I just feel like it could be, it's like, I love it, and it would be so much better if it had this thing that I could add to it is what, what we feel like a good reel represents, you know? You need to school the people you're working with right now because having audio as an afterthought in post-production is a big mistake for any game title. That stuff really needs to be incorporated early and I recommend the designers have a feel for audio. Uh, good audio in a game makes such a tremendous difference and it really does need to be being worked on the whole time that the game's going along. You should be thinking about this stuff early on. Uh, and you'd thrown out the concern that somebody with 30 days experience in the Casio can whip it together. That's, they're not going to get paid gigs in the game industry. I mean, so many companies want someone who can really lay orchestral tracks, and that person can't do that. Uh, you do need to have a demo reel. Don't go handing around CDs, because we're going to get a stack of them like this, and they're all going to get turned into trash. Thankfully, my wife will knit on them and turn them into cool uh, art. But uh, <laughs> They'll usually just get chucked, but have good tracks up online that are easily accessible. I want to just be able to go up there. I need some sound. Here's some folks I've talked to who have been recommended to me. I'm going to go uh, check it out. And in the end, it is really networking. I know a guy who knows a lady who knows somebody who knows a Martian who needs music. Afternoon. Afternoon. All right. Uh, so I graduated uh, Art Institute of Pittsburgh in December of '06, Game Art and Design. I'm from Pittsburgh. Yay! It's city. Um, I was working on a couple of mod teams, which led to a paid position out of the house, which was cool. Wake up, move five feet, go to work. Um, unfortunately, the project kind of ran into the ground, and ever since, I've been trying to find work. I've recently moved to New York City to do this. Um, everyone says networking is the key to getting these jobs. Um, what would you recommend is the best place to do this? Because just kind of blindly searching the internet kind of leads to nothing. I was relying on gamedevmap.com, just go, is this person hiring? No. Is these people hiring? No. So yeah, wh where would be the, be the best place to network? Um, I'd say, I mean, events like this is like all these people in this room are here for the same thing. Um, and you know, there's going to be a ton of talent that gets jobs. And it's like if you network, if you meet people that have the same interest as you, then inevitably you're, you're, you're going to know people that are in. And also just working on your stuff, like we said, working on my teams, um, going to other conferences like GDC, um, seeds that we're going to have later here this year. Um, all these events is for like-minded people to, you know, show up and talk about the thing they love to do is, you know, make video games. So uh, I'd say you're you're on the right foot right now, just coming to this. I guess the first question: Do you have a hit list of the top ten companies you'd want to work for in the games industry? Uh, the one that started me back when I was a child was. So the strategy I would take is to pick the top five, say, video game companies that you would like to work for. Try to pick places that have a nice level of churn. People come in, they leave, there's actually opportunities. A lot of the small developers have got the same group of 20 people in there forever, and there's no real opportunity for them to grow or hire someone. But find a nice sized studio, and then become a part of their community. Like one of the things that we look at, and we're very different because we're mainly hobby gaming, but we now have the video gaming side, is that we uh, call from the community of people that help support our games. We have hundreds of volunteers that go to these events for us and demo products. We have advocates online that talk about our games and are part of the community of people that help support us. And absolutely, I can tell you for a fact, many game companies will look to that community first when, it, when they uh, 
think about bringing someone in. And if you're a, one of the leaders on the forum that's always positive and is always, you know, helping to make sure that the messaging for their games is on track and that you have great insight into what it is they do, that's going to hold weight with the people that will eventually be helping make the decision on whether or not you're going to get a job. I know that for an absolute fact. And they will know who you are. The, the game developers read the message boards, good or bad, mainly bad. They do read the message boards. And if they know, hey, this guy is always positive, he's always stand, sticking up for us, you know, he has criticism, but they're always constructive criticism. This is someone that I would want to work with. And they, I've had specifically the opposite. I had somebody I was just about to hire who went on tilt on our message boards and we had an, like an AMA and I, he didn't get the job. And I was literally ready to send him an offer the following week. And because he just went crazy for some reason online, I, I decided I wasn't gonna hire him. And so be a positive force in the individual communities for these medium to large level or medium to medium large level developers and you can build a rapport with people there and that can eventually lead to a job. That's the best way to do it. Yeah. and. Uh, uh I think two things. One, one thing I just noticed really quick is uh, you're saying like, oh, I went on Game Dev Map and I and I saw that these places aren't hiring. Um, don't let that stop you. Just contact them. Like if they posted that they're hiring, they've already interviewed a ton of people, and now they're like, oh, we should post, we should post for this position because none of these people worked out or whatever. Um, I've never in my life posted a hiring position because I don't have time for that. I don't even know how to do that on, on a website. But I, I I'm constantly looking for people. All right. Um, uh, so just contact everyone, and and also just think about the way you're networking. Like uh, uh, at least for me, like I used to think of networking as this thing. Like I contact someone and say, hey, are there positions I can get? It's like, but think of networking more of like a slow burn thing. Like it's, there's no quick way to do it. Um, make friends. So like uh, when I started finally making a change, like when I w I went to Seattle and I, and I just emailed people that. Uh, at studios, I just looked them up online, found their blogs, and was like, hey, do you want to have lunch? Like, I love this work you made, right? And I didn't go, hey, do a job, <laughs> right? That's like walking up to somebody like, hey, you want, you want to get laid? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, no, you can like, freaking ask them to dinner and hang out and show that you want to get to know them. You're not just like, I want a paycheck. I want a paycheck from you. <laughs> Both of those comments have been uh, spot on. Uh, and uh, an example of companies that hire from the community, CCP here in Georgia, that does Eve Online, constantly hiring great out of the, straight out of the community. Um, uh, and the face-to-face -face networking, like they're talking about, the idea of build that relationship. I go back to what I said before. They want to know you're someone that you think they can work with when they need something, and you have that skill talent. That's great. Don't go up there handing someone your resume, begging them to look at your portfolio, et cetera. I think that's going to get you a job. Build that up to where they're willing to do that face-to-face. -face. Uh, we do monthly GGDA meetings here in uh, Georgia, second Tuesday of every month. Great chance to professionals. The IGDA also does monthly meetings in Georgia. There are IGDA, IGDA chapters elsewhere. Go out there and meet the community. Become an involved part of the community. I can't begin to count the number of people who've been to Siege, especially as volunteers who've gotten jobs. This is probably, it's well over 100 now at this point. They've gotten jobs because they were at Siege. They met people. They built a relationship. They then got internships. They proved themselves as volunteers doing other stuff that the game companies could see them doing. GDC is great for this. The hiring pavilion, maybe people do get hired in the hiring pavilion there, but I see the HR folks walk out of there with plastic tub after plastic tub of resumes. The folks I know who get hired there are the volunteers who help put GDC on. Those are the ones that the companies see being effective workers and are willing to follow up with. And, and don't underestimate like your fellow volunteers and students too. Like those are some of the best connections you can make, actually. Oh yeah, if you're going to school for game design, the one of the most important things you are paying for and often paying way too much for is those connections. If one of those people goes together and gets a job, make sure they think positively of you and want you to come in there and work with them down the line. And don't be the one they all hate and don't want to work with. <laughs> Okay, um, my question was going to be two-parted, but I guess I'll just kind of combine it. Um, it's sort of art-related. I want to be a concept artist, but 
Um, I can't really afford a fancy pants art school, and what I've noticed the most is that all my favorite concept artists and all the best ones have come from really nice art schools who have connections to to art companies, and like they have, they end up putting their own resumes online through the school, so they just get hired right out of school. I can't do that. So um, I guess my question is, if I'm a poor person who can't afford nice art school, how exactly should I go about? getting my stuff out there and sort of getting connected to people who can get me places. Well, I, I, I can just really quickly, uh, um, plenty of concept artists I've worked with didn't go to art schools and and, uh, and especially nowadays, like there's so many resources online. You, like the, the only thing is like, uh, you have to take it upon yourself to build a community and become part of a community and that's sometimes a little easier in school But it's totally doable on your own and it's still even when you're at school. It's still largely your Impetus right you have to get in there and, and make that happen You could easily go to art school and then go home and work by yourself Which a lot of people do which I'm like no, you're not even taking advantage of what you're paying for um, so uh, don't be discouraged by that, but just um, Because either way whether you go to school or not. It's all on you and you have to search out, and you have to make your portfolio, and, and become part of it. It's just, uh, um, you know, it's not literally placed into your lap when you're not in, in art school. Yeah, actually, the art school thing has nothing to do with it. Like everything else now, content is king. That's it. And so, if you are an amazing artist and you've put together some amazing pieces in your portfolio, like when I, I mean, we hire hundreds of artists to do trading card images, and I don't look at anyone where they went to school. I have no idea where anyone went to school that works on our trading card games. It's only based on their work. And so, putting together an amazing portfolio online uh, will give you absolutely the same level of opportunity that someone coming out of our school has, with the exception, as everyone's commented, of the contacts. And so it just becomes a you know the job of marketing yourself. Another thing about that is when doing that, target your stuff. Like do look at the game, look at the or look at the company. What do they make? Make some some stuff that would target directly at something that they could resonate with, and make it really really easy to get to. Like send me an email with two sentences and just check out this link, and then they click there and they see the art. They're done. Like every step it takes for someone to look at your work is just an opportunity for them not to do so in the first place. The best game concept artist I know is a fellow named John Bridges, who got his degree at Virginia Commonwealth University. I don't know if he paid a couple bucks for that degree or what, but uh, not an expensive school. Georgia State University here in Atlanta has a really good arts program. I'm constantly blown away by the quality of work that comes out of those folks. Uh, it really, as they've been pointing out, it comes down to what you can do and also how you can present yourself. The advantage of the overpriced art schools is that they have placement offices who, placement officers only keep their job by getting their graduates' jobs. Uh, so you're not necessarily going to have that at another school. You have to do that legwork. So make sure your stuff is up on DeviantArt. Get your stuff up there. Get your stuff seen. Uh, Get and be willing to do the, the hard work of networking, going out there, work on some of the cheaper projects, go to the game jams, get your stuff out there in front of people who might end up in companies or might even be at companies, and, uh, and be glad you graduate without the crushing debt. I, I will say though, like, and again, to try and be totally honest in this as well, uh, I look at hundreds, maybe thousands of artists' portfolios, and I can tell you nine times out of 10 if someone went to art school or not. And so I think the, the real thing that you also need to do is try to work with some other artists to get some feedback and make sure that you do understand whether or not your portfolio is actually at the level of what a game company would require. I mean, literally nine times out of 10, I can tell you if someone went to art school. Yeah, I'd say just uh, keep at it um, if you're refining your skills. Uh, we had a girl named Kayla Austin and she, uh, she would just constantly do fan art uh, for a game, Smite, and uh, she she kept posting stuff, and the stuff just was looking better and better. And we actually ended up hiring her about a month back, um, and she now helps out with uh, with our like character cards and in uh, our UI work. So uh, definitely just keep at it, really. Yeah, there's a great point raised about the cards in general along here, and uh, the number of people in the paper game industry. Uh, who get those jobs and then go on to computer side, video game side is tremendous. That's been one of the main 
feeder systems into the uh, digital entertainment uh, industry for artists. So go ahead and work on those uh, low-level stuff. Get your stuff out there, get it seen. And uh, I mean, we've had artists who did work with me, Vampire and Werewolf and Fading Suns, who that has been their portfolio to get them in the industry. The industry didn't care where they went to school. Yeah, it's crazy too. There is actually a big need for artists. Like I think there's a misconception that you know there's it's a there's a complete saturation of artists in the you know both pen and paper, but also in the digital side. That's absolutely not the case. A high-end, very talented artist will have very little problem getting a job, and whether it comes to freelance, like doing a piecemeal work for you know hobby gaming companies or a full-time gig with a video game company, there is actually still a pretty big need. And it really, I mean, the hard truth of it is, it comes down to the talent level. That's it. There's a there's a there's a need for good creative artists, not just not for artists. There are a lot of them, but for good creative artists, there's a real pressing need for that. Um, I believe you said you're a programmer? Yeah. yeah okay, I'm actually wanting to go into programming myself, uh, specifically scripting. Okay. And I was wondering if you could tell me like what languages you would recommend that I should learn to Python. use. Python? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would definitely, Python is a C-based language. I'm going to use a bunch of fancy terms here for a second. And the reason I say go straight to Python, uh, maybe JavaScript, but it's a little lighter, is all the other scripting languages are basically flavors, and so once you know Python, you can learn the rest of them just like that, essentially. Okay. So Python is a spectacular place to start. Um, if you like to mod, Skyrim has got a really, really good, like it's got a good manual, it's a huge community supporting it, and if you can learn the language to write scripts in Skyrim to do all sorts of goofy things, you just learned Python, you just didn't realize it. Yeah. And the same is true, the Unreal Engine uses Python as its interpreter as a back end. So. I was wondering which one I used, actually. Yeah, yeah, Unreal. it's Python on the back end. Unreal 3, I don't know, I, I know they've got a fourth engine out, and I haven't actually sat down and taken a look at it. Um, I think NDI is what's being used by Unity right now, like that's the one that everybody's pushing. Uh, it's a C-sharp variant, which is very similar to Python. Again, like if you know Python, you just know all this stuff. So yeah, Python's a really good start. Yeah, Python's really the only one I could think of immediately, but awesome, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting just, questions are always easy. It's <laughs> like, this is the right answer. We were like, <laughs> I just want to make a comment to the girl back there. Um, actually, if you post on a site called Behance, you're not posting with 10 year old anime artists like DeviantArt. DeviantArt also, if you read their um, terms and conditions, can sell you or anything you put on there to Photofolia for a dollar. And you'll make all of 12 cents off of it. Um, but by posting on Deviant, you are agreeing to having your work sold without your consent or even knowing where it's going or what they do. But the Hans, that's not true, and you have to be 18 to be on the site. And you get feedback from real artists. They said that. How do you spell that? B E H A N C E. Behance. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Deviant at all, but I will say I don't think there's ever been a case of them selling anyone's art. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they can't. I guess they could. I don't see why they would. But uh, and again, I'm not going to advocate for Deviant because their interface is awful. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I have, but I have found a bunch of artists from Deviant. I'll tell you that the community. So, is what makes but, but two years ago, they changed their terms of service. I, I understand. I hear what you're saying. I'm just saying I don't think this is. Uh, I shouldn't. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend people shy away from Deviant because of the potential for that, especially when it's never been done. And I can tell you for a fact that many people have actually gotten paying work from Deviant. So I think if you weigh the risk reward scenario there, you're probably better off putting your stuff on Deviant. But Behance is good. Behance is a new good one. Hello. Hi. So I know when everyone thinks of video games, you think of like the art and the programming. But what I'm really wondering is how do you stand out and get in as the writer side, like? making the stories and that, that give the life to the video game, like, how do you get into that? Like, to make yourself stand out from just, you know, writing short stories and books and stuff, but how do you become a writer for a video game? That's interesting. So, uh, we have a pretty big writing team at Riot, and I have no idea. <laughs> uh, uh, they have really various backgrounds, but like, I mean, uh, just write, I guess, um, and, and I don't know how they screen people or whether, but you know, people will have written up for shows. Like one of our one of our uh, writer dudes was like from Futurama and, and Avatar: Last Airbender. So I mean, whoa, you know, like uh, that's some awesome writing. <laughs> uh, so so you know, like just write a lot and and, uh, and you can't be going wrong when you're doing that. I don't know 
I, I know that's an area that probably doesn't have specific like schooling or paths you can take yet. So you have to kind of carve it out your, yourself and, and just look like scour the internet for blogs and, and find people who are writers for games, like look at like Bioware and things like that and, and find out what they're doing and if they have blogs and if they're talking about it, and email them and, and ask them questions and, and shower them with compliments and they'll tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I'd like to add in, it's not to interrupt, but just real quick, we had a panel earlier today on writing for video games and one of the big points they kept hitting on that panel was you need to be able to work well in a team and be collaborative and and be okay with things are going to get cut. That that's just the way of a fact of life. And you know, team building. You know, when you can work with a group is is really important. Um, and another thing that uh, one of the things that came out was that I don't know if you do any pen and paper role playing games, but you know. If being, you know, sometimes being the DM in a game lets you sort of get that game developer sense and lets you work with the other players to make that story and see how that works. And that really helps you get into the, the mindset of writing for video game. Yeah, the, so maybe role playing games is a bizarrely awesome way to get a bunch of video game development skill. And there is a degree, a lit degree, that'll help. So yeah. you can go to school for this. And then also in the, uh, the traditional hobby side, uh, it gives you a, a, an incredible opportunity to create content that will actually go to consumers. So if you look at like Pathfinder and all these other supplemental role-playing game systems, uh, you have a, an amazing chance to sort of integrate top-down writing into game design, which becomes this really fun way for you to show people that you can understand the marriage of the two. And then beyond that, the people that we've hired in the past were, uh, were typically just writers. And so if you want to be a writer, it's not necessarily that it needs to be game specific because all the principles that go into great storytelling, those are universal. Nothing's going to change. And so being someone who writes short stories, who you know tries to write that first novel, those are the things typically they're going to look at uh, if, if unless you're a high-end TV writer when they go to hire people to come into the games industry. I would also say though, yeah, and uh, like, Figure out though what are the specific needs of the medium that you're writing for. Like, so you know, I everything Corey just said about you know just write in general. But uh, like, for example, like um, in a trading card game, there's very specific needs that the game itself has for a lot of the writing requirements. You know, it's like well beyond what it's going to make a cool card name. It's like there's other stuff that the product needs out of that card name. It's not just, oh, this is a great name. It's like, well, what's a great card name for a trading card game specifically? So also make sure you do, do your homework and figure out, or, you know, and I, I, don't know, I don't know much about video game dialogue, but I'm sure there's kind of some stuff you can learn there too. Specific principles for the specific writing needs of that product. Do your homework, figure out what that stuff is too. Yeah, all of that stuff true everything we've been talking about already networking all that jazz is absolutely true uh, the paper game industry has fed again so many people into it others myself Bill Bridges uh, let's see uh, Shane Hensley great stuff now in the game industry um, Artel, the guys from Artel, Sorian all moved in all the uh, FASA people moving Sam Lewis is doing great stuff Zenimax so many paper game industry folks have made that transition great way to learn the basics Video game writing is a little bit of its own beast. You really want to be very concise in almost all games, especially for trading cards. you got to learn to put as much information in as little a space as you possibly can. But uh, this is all stuff that you can uh, definitely pick up. The one other secret, uh, once you are writing for games, especially if it's a free game, you're not getting paid, you're just helping folks out, you want to write a lot more than is ever going to be shown in that game. The more that you actually create will help that team out dramatically you really have to communicate well when you're working on a team in the game industry. It's so easy to suddenly find out you're on a diverging path from somebody else, especially on a small team that doesn't have experience, experience project management. And often it comes down to the writer to be creating that Bible that everyone can refer back to. Don't expect everything you write to be read. I mean, we as players are just going to space bar through it all anyway. But the team that does so often serve to really keep the team on the same line. You're often the one who's holding the whole game concept in your hand and everyone's referring back to. So even if you, you have specific tasks, you get those done, then keep writing more stuff that applies. First, I really appreciate all you guys coming out and sharing your time with us. I really enjoyed this panel. Aww. So thanks. <laughs> And that's all we have time. <laughs>
My question is, if I send an application to you guys, um, what's something I could show you in that application that would set me on the stack of people you want to talk to as opposed to all the rest? What field? Uh, I, I've been looking at level design, character design, quest design. So really the first, you uh, we've answered that question in a very uh, drawn out way through the entirety of this panel, which is don't just send a resume somewhere. I mean, Blizzard gets over 100,000 resumes a month. So just sending a resume somewhere is not going to do anything for you. So the, the first thing is, as we said earlier, try to embed yourself with the community. Pick the places that you would love to work and start to build some level of recognition with those people through the channels they already have in place. That's going to be the only way that you're probably going to get something like a cold call to have any chance of reaching the right person. And again, like, um, you know, going back to kind of the networking stuff and, you know, a lot of people were talking about that kind of seeing networking is not this kind of just sterile, oh, here's what I do and what do you need me to do this, but, you know, this kind of like, you know, no, show what you're passionate about and then make a connection with the person that you're trying to network with and, and uh, show them that you're passionate and stuff. Like, I, I love, you know, game, game designers come up to me and, and, and if someone comes up to me and they're passionate and they're like, here's my game and, you know, yada, 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 I'm, I'm always really happy to um, invest in making a connection with that person, hear what they have to say, and check out their stuff. And those are the things that people remember. You know, you show somebody that you're passionate. I mean, because we're, you know, we are passionate about this stuff. So we respond well to other people that are passionate and awesome, you know, making a connection with you. So. You know, yeah. The, beyond just a resume, find 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 somebody. You know, it, not everybody will necessarily has the ability to give you the time of day at any given point in time. But you know, somebody will at some point. So yeah, make make that connection. And a really sneaky way to do this that works really well is instead of trying to send a resume to the company, go to the forums, do something appropriate to one of their games, and just post about it. So like, I want to go to Bethesda. I'm going to make a Skyrim mod, and then I'm going to go to the forums and say, here's this mod I made for Skyrim. Everybody starts talking about it. That is going to mean so much more to me when I see like, oh wow, look at this form thread that's hot because they're talking about this guy's mod, and then I'm going to look at him. Than if I just get a resume, and if it doesn't like get a hot thread, I won't see it. I'll miss it. So you've got zero failure and only the opportunity for success, right? And like our memories are really short. So if you're like you do something horrible, like one week. And, and like next week you do something awesome, we're not gonna be like, well, but he did something horrible last week, so, so we don't, you know, we won't know necessarily. I remember ever horrible yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and an important note about this panel is I don't think any of us are the first line of defense against your resumes. We're not the first people to see them. We're not the trash mobs in your quest to get the job. We're, we're not the final boss monster, we're not the epic level, we're the big boss. Well, actually, I'm the epic monster of my company, but never mind that. Uh, but your resume will end up on these people's hands at some point if it makes it through the path. One thing I recommend for everyone here who wants a job within the industry, whether you're looking now, and especially if you're not looking now, if you're looking for a couple of years down the line, start going to gamblesuture.com now. Who goes to gamblesuture.com on a regular basis? All right. You know, you need to be a lot more of you. Uh, in the upper left corner is the Game Jobs tab. Click in there, just start looking at those jobs. See what they want. One of the, the problems with the trash mob that is human resources and companies is that they just have a checklist of things. And they're going through it when they get your resume. If this, the stuff that's on their checklist is on your resume, that resume gets passed on, trashed, it's filed away for some other position. Make sure you have what companies are actually looking for right off the bat. But really quick, at the same time, ignore it. Yeah, like, and just yeah. apply, yeah. right? Like, if, if they say, like, oh, we want five years of experience, I still don't have five years of experience. Every, everything I've applied for has wanted five to ten years of experience. I don't have it now. Um, There's so a lot like, of ways to interpret that. If they say AAA title, they usually mean that. If they just say, have a game done, that really can be an amateur thing. You got up somewhere else and none of the small team. What I write in my job requirements is stuff that I don't ever imagine I'm going to get. It's just like, this would be fucking spectacular. <laughs> But I never expected to hit on all notes. Um, hey, I was wondering, is there any benefit of an artist, a concept artist, or a three D modeler having a programming degree or having programming knowledge? There's a massive, massive benefit. There's a huge difference between those people. I work with uh, the, we call those technical artists inside the region. You don't need to necessarily be an engineer as well. But for, like, as a trivial example, all textures have to come in these powers of twos because of the way old video cards work. Newer video cards don't have a problem with this, but the old ones do. 
So if you give me a texture that's like 27 pixels by 27 pixels, I either have to pad it out to 32 by 32 or I uprise it, which we all know that's a fucking disaster, right? So the guys who know that, they target their stuff and they're like, okay, well I know that I'm gonna be, I'm making a texture for something, I wanna make it inside this space. And they're able to target exactly what they're going for and there's no back and forth. And otherwise with other artists, I have to bring it back and go, let me explain to you why I need this very specific thing. Can you fix it for that? And then they don't really understand exactly that. Like, you know, another one is your a lot of phones in a single app. They can display 32 million colors, but they can only use 256 in the reference at a point in time. So an artist who doesn't know that gives me an image with 4,000 unique colors in it, and I'm like, I'm gonna lose 3,500 of these things as soon as I put it on the screen. The guy who knows, does works with a palette, and everything's just fine again. So yeah, there is, Huge value to having technical knowledge, but you don't need to write a program. It would be sweet, but if you just have like an understanding of the technical pipeline, you just are head and shoulders easier to work with for the programming team. Yeah, and for, for animation, I mean, that's so valuable and so rare, uh, like, you know, for technical rigors and things like that. Like, basically the difference is like most artists, including myself, we sit around going, I, man, I wish there was a button for this. Why do I have to do this? And then there's like 1% of us that goes, I could just make that. <laughs> I guess I could, I could just do it. <laughs> um, and those people are really, really valuable because they save so much work. So if, you, if you're able to think that way and, and add that stuff and, and save work for people, that's amazing. Hey, um, I'm a sophomore in college at SCAD, actually. Um, <laughs> and I'm really just interested in everything in general. And I was wondering if there's any specific direction I could go that is particularly needed in the industry, or if there was, because right now I'm looking at animation, but also game design, I'm really interested in, you know, designing levels and um, particles, you know, pretty much everything in the industry I'm interested in, and um, I was wondering if there's anything in particular. I can tell you that I've literally never applied for a job in my entire life. Like, if you get an engineering degree, you will be sought after. Yeah, uh, I mean, if I were just to like name something, like it's really hard to find the VFX artists. Um, that's pretty rare, good animation VFX. But the thing is, like, my best advice to you is like, do what you really like doing, um, because if you chase after like what's most needed, first of all, you're always going to be late, because by the time you learn it, it might not be that thing anymore, and then you're going to be like, I didn't really like doing this. <laughs> um, and if you if you love it, it's going to come across in your work. So so just do what you love, and then you'll demonstrate the need for it be, by being awesome. Right. And to build on that, learn what you love. You at Atlanta, Sky Atlanta, or Savannah? Savannah. Okay, Louis uh, runs a good program down there. You guys do have the game jams, got a chance to work on a bunch of different teams. Definitely make it out of them and try the different roles and see where you feel you can do the best work and where you're, you're comfortable continuing to do that uh, sort of work. They'll be, they'll will, they will be, 90% sure of this, a global game jam site for January 2014 in Savannah. Uh, certainly come up to Atlanta for Siege or our game jam sites, but try out all those different things. See what really does work for you and where you are good. Yeah, I'd say having gone to SCAD in Savannah um, and gone through the program, uh, they definitely give you enough rope to hang yourself with. <laughs> it, there's so many electives you have to choose from and there's just all these different uh, specialties that you can sort of specialize in. So it's, uh, it's, it's really important to try and figure out what you want to do early, but I mean, I was in the same position you were in in my sophomore year. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, I say just feel it out and try and figure out what, what exactly you want to hone in on and then take those, those elective classes to, you know, just real quick, there's like this epic hand raise in the back that's been waiting. Yeah! <laughs> so we can hit that guy Whoa. next. <laughs> I, have, I have a question on the mic. I'm a graphic designer and I just started like trying to test the waters with game design. And for the past two months I've been working on my first iOS game. So I'm kind of taking all these hats of graphic designer, writer, uh, game development, like everything. So I'm starting to try to build my team and maybe even possibly build my own company out of all this. So what would be some tips as far as marketing, as far as development that I could really get a head start with early on? 
All right, as the one who owns his own company in here, if you're gonna do your own company, your own game, et cetera, you've got to be able to do everything. I can do everything well. I mean, my, my good programming days are way behind me. My heart has always sucked. But uh, I can at least pass through it, patch stuff up that needs to get patched up and cleaned up and so forth. And you need to know how to do the marketing. And if you're doing your own company, you've got to know how to get the word out yourself. Social networking has made that so, such a big plus. But uh, everything I've said about networking already goes five times over for you because no one else is going to get the word out for you until you've really convinced them to be that evangelist for you. I'm, I'm glad I've got fans and friends who will do that kind of stuff. But uh, you've really got to work that area. I, I hate the fact that if I'm, when I'm head down and work, that really only needs a couple of hours of game design. The rest is uh, getting the word out and various uh, running company BS. But uh, be ready to wear every single hat. Thanks for recognizing uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, um, okay, so there's like DeviantArt for artists. Uh, what about programmers? I mean, is there something, you know, you're talking about, send me an email, hey, click here, check this out. I mean, I'm sure I can't go look at my polymorphism, you know, that type of thing. I mean, how do we present that? It's like a game designer who wants to program. Uh, well, there's SourceForge, for sure, right? Um, okay. Mods are huge, like, okay. definitely. Uh, a lot of the stuff I did before, I and I never really intended to get into this industry. It was a complete happy accident. But I still did a lot of mods, and I still to this day people recognize some of the mod work I've done. So mods are a spectacular way for like a hybrid designer programmer to be like, okay, I'm gonna design it, then I'm gonna actually make it happen. So that's incredibly valuable. Okay, so I don't need to like have my own website. Hey, download this program, install it. Here's my UML drive diagrams, all that kind of stuff. If stuff. your email is two sentences and a link to a mod that's got a 9.7 rating, that's all you fucking need. Okay, <laughs> cool. Thank you. There are communities as well that you should be aware of. I mean, if you're working in Unity, be active on that Unity forum. I and mean, there's a lot of questions people have out there. If you can start answering them, that's, that's an incredibly useful position to be in. And like you were saying, programmers get sought after, and folks are trolling around seeing someone who can solve the problems they already have. You're being hired because they need someone else to solve their problems. And if you can show you do it somewhere, that's what they want. Yeah. And also, if you're pursuing programming, get an active degree. A degree in computer sciences. Mandatory. Yeah, pretty much. If you don't have it, then you're working from zero. It's going to be tough. Let me get a quick comment on degrees. I mean, game degrees, we've kind of been making some jokes about them. They've gotten a lot more respect in the industry than they used to, especially since Portal uh, came into being. It was originally known as a student project. But uh, while you'll rarely see a, a, a job posting that says must have a game design degree, you'll, for a programming position, you will see must have a computer programming degree. But what they'll almost always say, in fact, I've never seen a posting thing say this, must have a college degree. So you really do need that college degree. There's so few people now in the industry who don't have that degree. If they do, they were really good and could prove it right off the bat. Go to college, get a degree that'll keep you in college. Part of the advantage for us is it shows that you can stick with something that's kind of difficult over a long time to completion, which is basically what game dev is. Yeah, and engineering is weird in that it's something that it's just there's a right and wrong and you learn it. The degree just speaks volumes. I just wanted to pull a quick little hidden lesson I think out of what you just said, which is a common theme with a lot of people I work with that are really talented is uh, they did the stuff they loved and they like literally had no idea that it could be their job, right? It's just like, that was me too. Uh, and it's not everyone's, it's not the case for everyone, but I was animating long before I knew that was a thing. Um, and I was just like, this is awesome. I love this. Uh, I, w I want to do this. And like, and while going to school for engineering, and then suddenly it was someone like, you should think about going, like doing animation. I'm like, there's, but oh, we, we people do that. <laughs> You know, so like, and just like you said, like you kind of, it was a happy accident, but you were doing something awesome, right? And you do, you're doing, you're making mods because you freaking want to make mods. And you're not thinking, I, I need to make a mod for my reel, right? You're thinking, I want to make a mod because I want, I want to play this and I want it to be awesome. That's like a, that's a sentiment that I think you'll be, you'll, you'll share uh, if you think that way uh, with a lot of people. It's just like, we want to make the games we want to play. We don't want to make the games to make money, right, necessarily. It's just like, I want to play this so bad, and I just want to make it. So, yeah. I wanted to throw one thing out there. A lot of people have been kind of mentioning they're interested in multiple different stuff, or they're doing a project where they want to be a game designer and a programmer um, and or an artist or whatever. Um, and <laughs> uh, I don't mean this to sound uh, negative at all, but, uh, you know, Whenever you know, whenever we look at game design uh, applications, it's not like you know we get a ton of applications and then we hire one person. And the reality is not that it's usually a hard choice. I mean, usually it's like 
I, you know, from my perspective, I kind of conclude that almost nobody is really at the level that we want, and there's maybe one or two people that really have the chops. And like um, game designers, especially fledgling game designers, I think very frequently just it, it don't realize that there's a lot of kind of proprietary knowledge that they don't have yet. Um, so really pursue reading up on that knowledge. Like, and, and a lot of people make it available. Wizards of the Coast, for example, they, they write a ton of stuff about their game design theory. Riot, the, those, those guys are total masters and they, they make their stuff publicly known. And so make sure that you really understand that stuff because I, I think a lot of people kind of start with game design and they go, oh, I got this cool idea, you know, it's gonna be, be an MMO where you're a wizard and there's all different kinds of wizards and you summon an army of zombies and, and it all sounds really cool and like this great idea and you got some idea how to fit art with it, but all those decisions, you know, have lots of ramifications. I mean, there's lots of stuff that you have to know about all that stuff. Um, so I just, I would just throw that out there, it is, you know, especially for anybody that's thinking of doing game design along with something else, just, just make sure, make sure that you don't have gaps, make sure that you've done your homework and try to get people that you trust to verify that you know what you're doing because a lot of people spend a lot of time making games, programming games or board games or anything and they made this whole thing and especially people that are like taking the time to get art and programming and done for it and then I see it and I'm just like, God, this is such an awesome project but there's just some kind of fundamental things about game design that they just didn't realize they didn't know, and then they made this whole project out of it, you know, and kickstarted it and whatever, and it didn't kickstart. And um, so just just make sure you check your blind spots, I would say. All right, so um, that's going to be it for the panel. Um, I appreciate you guys coming on out. We've, uh, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, so why don't we have a round of applause for the guys up on the panel here? Thank you. our second year of the video gaming track here at Dragon Con. You guys have been making it a tremendous success this year. Hope to see you again next year. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>